on EPZ, SEZ, their benefits, also the bird's eye view on uh, the VSEZ and the aspects of EOU versus SEZ. I request uh, Sri Shitit Jain, IRS, Assistant Commissioner of Customs, Vishakhapatnam, to address the audience. <coughs> has been happening for quite some time, uh, not just for the benefit of students, but for the benefit of industry, for the benefit of trade. Uh, and it is really heartening to see the, the passion with the China of export uh, promotion. And uh, it, it's, it's good to have him on the other side so that many of the issues which were dwindling between customs and EJFT for so long, we were able to solve over phone, telephonic conversation itself. So thanks, Punam, for having me here. Uh, I'll I'll divide my uh, my session in two halves. First half, I'll talk about customs, some some of the procedures. I'll not get uh, much into the technicalities, but I'll talk about where the, what exactly customs do in the whole uh, process flowchart of export promotion. Uh, I'll give you some idea about Visa Customs, uh, the role we play, and in the second half, I'll talk. I'll, I'll make it a more general discussion. I'll talk about uh, areas where you as young intelligent students can pitch in uh, and, and contribute towards export, export promotion or any such related activity. So, customs role in export promotion. Historically, if you see, customs was, or for example, for, for that matter, any taxation department was not really seen as a promoter of exports or trade. We were seen more as regulators, you know, people who would come and just tax you till you die and <laughs> traders. All right, and uh, uh, and since then we have been consciously working. I'm, I'm not sure how successful we are, or we have been, but we have been consciously working to to change our own perception of being as just tax regulators and tax collectors to actually being trade facilitators. And then customs started becoming one of the key players in export promotion. Now, why, do, why does government want to increase exports? You know, what, what, what is the entire logic of having more exports? For an exchange. Okay. For an exchange, right? So, uh, you, would, you would have heard the concept of trade deficit, right? So, and you would all know that for years together, we have had negative trade deficit. I mean, we have had positive trade deficit, sorry. Which means that our outflow of foreign exchange was much more than the inflow. Right, and slowly and slowly our foreign reserves were actually coming down. And therefore the need of export promotion came in. In fact, when the crisis, when the economic crisis hit the world market, that time India could still uh, breathe a sigh of relief because we had, we had ample of forex uh, reserves. There was a time in 1990s where we did not have forex reserves to sustain even three weeks. Right? So, uh, from there to now, where we have forex reserves almost close to $300 billion, I think we have come a long way. And uh, one of the key reasons why that has happened is because we have shifted our focus from just importing technologies and materials from outside to actually becoming centers of manufacturing and centers of making products that can be exported. So, and then came these new, new, I mean, DGFT, if you, if you have seen uh, Director General uh, of Foreign Trade, this has become specially relevant in recent times. Uh, they're not so talked about SEZs. These concepts, EPZs, SEZs, DGFT, uh, you know, all these concepts came in only to encourage exports. Right? DGFT came in just to formulate policies at a national level which will actually increase foreign trade. And DGFT does a wonderful job. They read, uh, they, they make policies which are in unison with the world's World Trade Organization's directives. So we can be rest assured that most of our policies are in line with the international policies. And that is where DGFT comes in. And once those policies are made, there has to be an organization which implements those policies at the ground level. And then customs pitch in. Right? So DGFT would probably make a policy saying that uh, let's encourage export of these, these, these items. Or let's have duty-free imports of certain items which are used in the manufacture of products that will be subsequently exported. Right? So they will come with paperwork and they'll come with a policy. That policy is then given to Ministry of Finance, which comes down to customs or central excise or service tax. And then we finally implement that policy and we ensure or try to ensure that 
at the ground level also, what has been said and written and committed in paper sees the reality. Alright? So, that is the entire role of customs. I talk about few areas where we have tried to uh, uh, give a fillip to exports. There's this entire concept of licenses, export promotion licenses. Uh, Dr. Punam will be able to throw much light on it when he talks about foreign trade policy. But the idea is that a lot of these exporters, they, have, they do not really procure inputs domestically. Right? They, they procure inputs from outside India. So they have these imported goods, they import those goods, manufacture the items over here and then export it. And we want to encourage export. And because we want to encourage export, government came with a policy that if you are importing things or goods which will be subsequently used to make export products, then you can import it without customs duty. Alright, so a normal import would probably end up paying uh, customs duty. There are multiple uh, uh, multiple uh, categories of customs duty. There is basic customs duty, CVD and all those things. But all in all, it would, he would end up paying around 20-25% of duty. Right? But here are these people who, who are allowed duty-free imports. Primarily with an obligation to export their final product. And these licenses are categorized in two, two types of categories. Alright, there is this one license where it is, these are advanced licenses. Where you have not exported anything till now, but you are making a commitment to the government that if you allow me to import say X quantity of certain materials, duty free, I will be able to export Y quantity of certain material uh, eventually using these items. You have not exported anything till now, but government goes by your commitment and gives you a license. DGFT is the authority which gives you the license. And they give you the license saying that under this license, you will be able to import 100 crores of goods and they list the goods also. And with these goods, you should be able to make these goods and export 200 crores of these goods. And once that license is issued, the actual import and export under that license is monitored by customs. So that's where customs come in. But this, these licenses come with an obligation. You would appreciate that you have made a commitment to the government. And for two years or for one year, government has actually allowed you duty-free import. So tomorrow if you do not meet the export obligation, then actually you have in a way resulted in loss of revenue to the government. You agree to that? Right? So th that is where customs come in. That if at all you have not been able to meet your export obligation, then customs would come in and say that, this is the duty that was forgone and this is the duty that you have to pay since you did not meet your obligation. This is one kind of license. These are advanced authorization licenses. Then there is another kind of licenses. Chapter 3 of the foreign trade policy, I'll again not bore you with, with uh, minute details, but you should just know that there is one chapter 3 of the foreign trade policy under which certain scripts are issued. What are these scripts? These scripts are post-export scripts. In this, in this case, you have already exported certain things. So you would go to DGFP say that I have already exported 10 crores of goods. Against 10 crores of goods, please give me a credit script of some XYZ rupees. They have a formula, they will calculate and give you the script. Script is nothing but a simple blank paper which you can use to pay your duty. So for example, if DGFT gives you a script of 100 rupees, then you can continue utilizing it to pay 100 rupees of customs duty. You really don't have to pay any cash. You really don't have to deposit any money with the government. Only thing is, if you import certain items which is worth, which has a customs duty of 100 rupees, you will just show the script to customs and customs will let, walk, you know, let you walk out with that item without collecting duty. So this is post-exportation. This does not have an obligation because you have already exported. So there is no undertaking that you have given to the government that I will also subsequently export. You have already exported, you have met your obligation. So these are broadly the two categories of licenses or scripts which the government gives so as to encourage uh, and give impetus to exporters. I'm clear? Am I? Right? You can just stop me when, whenever you think I'm going berserk. Uh, then there are other, other things also. There is this concept of FTAs you would have read foreign trade agreements, uh, concessional trade agreements. What are these? These are again uh, agreements that are in line with the principles of WTO to promote international trade. Uh, 
these are agreement for we we have an agreement with korea we have an agreement with japan we have an agreement with asean countries we have we have an agreement with uh, uh, certain african countries the entire idea is that these are the places these are the countries with which we want to encourage bilateral trade uh, we want to we want to open their markets to our products and open our markets to their products it's a win win situation for both the countries right so there are these concepts this again customs actually monitor so probably for example you are importing this pen from uh, from say us you would end up paying duty of 10% but maybe under the agreement that we have with korea you have and if you are importing this from korea you will be only required to pay say 2.5% or maybe sometimes 0% so customs is the uh, is the organization which finally sees whether you are eligible to take that benefit how do we check that there is this sacro signed document called country of origin document all right country of origin document is nothing but a document issued by their chamber of commerce or their ministry of commerce to authenticate that this product indeed belongs to our country international trade when you learn more and more about it you will see that it's a very complex system not everything that is manufactured in indonesia is coming to india directly from indonesia right you would see that the invoice is raised by somebody sitting in germany about the product which is manufactured in indonesia so how do you actually know whether this product is actually indian of indonesian origin or not and there the country of origin certificates comes into force so customs actually just sees the authenticity uh the veras checks the veracity of the country of origin certificate if you are satisfied we just extend that benefit so this is another kind of benefit in addition to licenses scz trinath sir i think has uh, uh, has thrown light in detail uh, what scz do uh, so i will not go much into that i talk about certain initiatives that have been taken by the department of customs and not just customs i i'll I just give you a brief customs is not a stand alone department it is basically the entire department of indirect taxation uh it comes at the ministry of finance central board of excise and customs is the governing body uh we govern the, the tax collection of uh, we govern three kinds of tax collection service tax excise and customs in addition to certain policies related to narcotics all right and cbec and ministry of finance has taken certain initiatives which are not just in the benefit of export organizations but in the benefit of uh, industry in general uh, these days the buzzword is ease of doing business right you would be reading about ease of doing business every now and then so what is ease of doing business what is ease of doing business anybody i will not uh, uh, pinpoint anyone but can you just tell me how can you just a simple question if i were to ask you uh, that how can we ease uh, doing business in the country or how can we make life simple for the industry in india what would be your suggestion Sorry, single window procedure. Single window procedure, fantastic. Going online, going online, fantastic, excellent. Not hampering the industries with taxes. Sorry, not hampering the industries with taxes. Non hampering. Do you mean that we should not collect tax? Non intrusively collect tax, right? We should not be, uh, we should not become intrusive, right? We should not just go and stand in the in the factory and say that give us tax, otherwise we'll not move out, right? Anything else? All right, you pretty much covered all the things. I think these are the three points that are written in the notebook also. So now, if I say the same thing, you will say that I am cheating. But yeah, so that that's how we do, uh, and that is what these are the kind of steps that the government is taking. Uh, when you talk about online uh, online interface, then uh, you would you would anyway be knowing about income tax and how easy it has become to file returns. right for a common man similarly it has become significant i am not saying it is full proof but it has become significantly easier even for industry and trade and importers and exporters to file returns online without a problem right there is a huge data database and data interface which has made it very easy for them to file returns and uh, import and export documents online and in fact recently till i think from 3 3 weeks back uh we also introduced this concept of digital signature so earlier we were we were imploring uh importers and their concept of digital signature which is almost become mandatory uh and so long as your signature is registered in the system you can just submit the documents online and we wouldn't bother you uh, to submit hard copies of it 
That is number one. Uh, you talk about single window agency. Uh, in fact, this year, the, the Ministry of Finance and CBC has declared this year uh, as the year of digital customs. Uh, two, two days back, we celebrated International Customs Day. There's this uh, day, and uh, in fact, uh, it's 26th of January, which is, which is observed as International Customs Day throughout the world. Uh, it is anointed as International Customs Day by the World Customs Organization. So two, years, two days back, we were celebrating that, and Pan India, the theme given by the ministry was Digital Customs. Uh, in fact, when we were celebrating it in the Customs House, uh, one of the guest speakers that we had was the HOD of Computer Science from Andhra University. Uh, basically to draw the point that now is the time when you really can't when you really can't separate government and non-government stakeholders. Now is the time when I, I think everybody has to collectively come and work towards realizing certain goals of the government. So if you think that the government does not have the expertise or the machinery to, to implement certain ideas, you should be open to take the help of uh, industry experts or academicians or professors or students. Right? This happens uh, uh, in many of the other countries where you have lateral entries of uh, people. I mean, you have you don't really have to write an exam to get into government job. You have lateral entries of uh, uh, experts. You know about the concept of UID, right? You have Mr. Nandan Ilagani. He he did not have to uh, get elected through a normal process and become a minister uh, minister rank officer. He was I mean, his his expertise was appreciated by the government and leveraged. And this is this is the time when we are required to do that. Uh, so digital customs is one of the one of the targets that we have set out for ourselves for this year to make customs more and more uh, friendly uh, and one of the key areas there is single window agency now what is single window agency I think you all know everything in, at one single window even when you talk about exports and imports there are ten different documents that the traders are required to produce and those ten different documents will be from ten different places. If you are importing something as simple as say timber log, you know, wood, I would seek 10 different documents. There would be a phytosanitary certificate which would be required from one organization. If you are importing a meat product, there would be another certificate that I would be uh, requiring. If you are importing an electronic, I would be requiring another certificate called the PIS certificate which is so tens and scores of different certificates. And what happens? The vessel is here, it is birthed at the port. The person has filed the import document and now he's struggling to get these documents just for customs clearance. So what we have done now is that we are planning to have the single window agencies where all these people or representatives of all these organizations will be sitting at the major port itself. So the importer who is importing will be able to get these documents at one place. And in one go he should be able to make the clearance of his goods. And uh, I'll be honest, even I was not able to appreciate that idea at that time. And look what he has done. He has brought technology in in the space of taxi service. Was it possible five years back to even think that taxi and technology can be linked? But he has done it. You have an app, you just open the app, you click on, on that app and the taxi will be at your doorstep. You don't have to call anybody, you don't have to explain where you are stationed, you don't have to give him directions to your place, you don't have to negotiate the price. Everything is just online. Right? Oyo rooms for that matter. Uh, do you Have you heard of Oyo rooms? You know who is the CEO of Oyo rooms? The main guy. Ritesh Shagarwal. He's 22 years old. And he's a boy from Odisha. Yeah, and he was studying at Delhi University where one fine day he just realized that he has this brilliant idea of uh, uh, you know, collaborating with the people having guest houses or residential complexes and having rooms over there. He had this idea at the age of 17. He dropped out of college. Not that I'm encouraging you to drop out of college. <laughs> but, but he did. And uh, he took some time off. And look where he is now. He's the youngest Asian billionaire. It's, it's amazing what these guys have been able to achieve. So this is, and the reason why I am particularly bullish about entrepreneurship is because I am seeing how these people are running their offices. You know, we talked about corruption uh, some time back. And a lot of, I am not walking away from the responsibility of the government uh, or the government officials. Uh, but you also have to appreciate that it was always a two-sided story. If there was somebody 
who was ready to collect certain amount as bribe, there was always somebody who was ready to give that amount as bribe. Right? But now things are changing. All these people, all these new brand of entrepreneurs, they are, they, they, they just mean business. They'll come to you and they'll say that, what am I doing wrong? Why should I pay up for anything else? And slowly and slowly you would see that even from the side of the government, that entire rigidity is, is melting down. Because your generation, our generation is becoming vociferous. We are not, we are, we are challenging the status quo. If this was happening till now, why should this continue to happen? You know? And there this whole concept of disruption comes in. Disruption is there, for example, what Ola has done is a disruptive technology. Why is it a disruptive technology? It has completely disrupted the taxi market. There was a Meru, there was an Easy Cab which were looting you. And now you don't even see them. And that kind of bind you would want both in the industry and both in, and in the government. Some of you may join the industry, some of you may become entrepreneurs, some of you should also come on the side of the government because you need these kind of disruptions everywhere. You need people to challenge status quo everywhere and only then we will be able to move forward. Otherwise, whatever changes we bring in will only be incremental. We will go from point A to A prime, that's it, but not from A to Z. So that is where I would implore you to pitch in, think about these things consciously. Not all of, all of you have to become uh, have to have your own startups. Not all of you have to become entrepreneurs. Not all of you have to become civil servants either. But whatever you do, think consciously. Don't just think that you know it is the responsibility of the government or it is the responsibility of my MD. It is the responsibility of the business head. Each one of you now has a role to play in making certain ambitions realities. All right. So do pitch in. Give your thoughts. Be vociferous. Challenge the status quo, and uh, if we keep doing that, then uh, I think there are better days ahead. Right? Thank you.